Hello, everyone. I'm Justin Blethro, Senior Product Manager here at PacBio, and I want to welcome everyone to the PacBio webinar series with today's topic focused on providing you with an understanding of the benefits and unique advantages of PacBio HiFi sequencing on the SQL 2e system and how our technology is empowering leading scientists, core labs, and service providers in their research and business services. I'm joined today by two great speakers who will present in the following order. Olga Venere peterson Project Coordinator at Uppsala Genome Center, followed by Melissa Smith, Assistant Professor at the University of Louisville. We have a lot of great material to cover today, and the presentation portion of the webinar will be followed by a Q&A session. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing them in the area provided on your attendee control panel, and we'll get to them at the end. We've also uploaded a number of complimentary pieces of literature to your control panel, so please feel free to download them and take them with you. We will be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days. Please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to the recording. So with that, let me get started by giving you a short overview and update on our technology. It's now been just a little over two years since PacBio first introduced HiFi Reads to the world. In that time, and driven in no small part by dramatic improvements in performance and data output with the release of the SQL 2 system, HiFi reads have gone from being an intriguing new possibility to being widely seen as the sequencing technology of choice for any application that benefits from the informative power of long reads. And if you spend a little time on social media these days, it's not hard to find comments like the ones I've shown here, with scientists working on a diverse range of applications and species volunteering how HiFi reads make their results better and their workflows easier. As Molly Zeller puts it, there's no going back now, it's high fire bust. So just why are all these scientists and service providers so excited about HiFi reads? Well, it's because HiFi reads provide something no other sequencing technology can, long reads at high accuracy. This combination provides a synergistic advantage. By allowing clear discrimination between long, but even highly similar sequences, HiFi reads empower a range of applications from whole genome assembly and variant analysis to an RNA transcript sequencing and large amplicon analysis. Let's take a closer look at how HiFi reads are generated and what these, those data really look like. In HiFi sequencing, we read single DNA molecule templates each many times over. Because the error is highly random with multiple observations, the accuracy increases dramatically leaving us with HiFi reads that contain very little residual error. By definition, HiFi reads are those that achieve a single molecule consensus accuracy of greater than or equal to 99%. Because these reads are so accurate, we need to look at them on the logarithmic thread scale to see details in the distribution. On the right is a typical histogram of reads by thread score. With a median value of Q33, or 99.95% .95 accuracy. In contrast, other long read technologies provide nowhere near the same read level accuracy. But if we zoom out and we drop the log scaling, we can see how they compare. Even considering recent experimental advances, other long reads provide median accuracies only approaching Q20. For example, this recent technology demonstration from ONT shown in green from December of last year, with a median accuracy of 98.3%, or one error every 59 bases or so. In contrast, this typical HiFi run in yellow shows one error every 2,000 bases. In fact, there's hardly any overlap between these distributions. If we zoom back in, we can see the ONT data in green is tailing out while the HiFi data in yellow is just getting started. And we can see the HiFi data is meeting and exceeding the performance standards set by short read technologies. Let's take a look at why this matters. For one thing, highly accurate data makes long read assembly much more computationally efficient. Assembling a human genome with HiFi reads is more than four times faster than the most efficient solution for ONT reads. And the more than 30 fold higher per read accuracy with HiFi translates into more than 30 fold higher accuracy in variant calling. When we look at the results of the recent precision FDA truth challenge, we can see that HiFi reads actually outperformed all competing technologies for overall accuracy, accuracy, showing the fewest total errors. In fact, the PacBio call set outperformed all the other call sets for structural variants 
and it outperformed the standard Illumina GATK call set for both SMVs and Indels. It even outperformed the state-of-the-art Illumina Deep Variant call set for SMVs, while approaching the Illumina Deep Variant call set for Indels. And it far outperformed the ONT Pepper Deep Variant call set for Indels and SMVs. So now that I've told you what you can expect from HiFi Reads, let me share some of the exciting work going on with them across four major areas. One thing we're really excited about is how HiFi is contributing to a rapidly growing set of efforts, some shown here, to sequence the vast biological diversity of our planet on a comprehensive scale. These projects are broadly adopting HiFi sequencing as their foundation, given the superior de novo genome assemblies they can obtain with it. We're also excited to see HiFi contributing to the rise of pan-genome sequencing efforts for economically relevant plant and animal species. These projects are showing how much additional value there is in capturing the fuller diversity within a given species, especially when it comes to the complex variations that are missed with mapping of short reads to a reference, and which often serve as a library of phenotypic diversity. Now, of course, 2020 brought numerous challenges in the form of a devastating global pandemic. Like many others in the genomic space, we, prior, we prioritized bringing our technologies to bear however we thought they could help. And we have been privileged to work with the researchers at LabCorp starting in April of last year to develop a high throughput workflow for complete SARS-CoV-2 viral genome sequencing, which is now available for use. LabCorp then received a contract from the CDC to apply this pipeline for a large-scale longitudinal genomic survey that aims to improve understanding of these mutations, how they are transmitted, and how the public health response to these mutations can be improved. Through this program, the CDC aims to more than double the rate at which it conducts genomic sequencing of the COVID-19 virus. Our HiFi viral assay offers key advantages to customers relating to both the quality of results they can achieve, specifically better primer balancing, fewer amplicon dropouts, and the ability to capture all variants, and to the practical considerations around implementation, particularly cost effectiveness, effectiveness and batch size flexibility. We've also been very pleased to see PacBio HiFi sequencing being adopted by leading medical institutes and consortia, particularly for the investigation of inherited diseases. Next, I'll show you a couple of examples where HiFi sequencing helped explain cases that were previously unexplained with NGS. Here we have the very first demonstration of long read sequencing identifying the cause of a Mendelian disease. This was the case of a 22-year-old male with recurring heart tumors that was unexplained with NGS. You and Ashley from Stanford applied PAC biosequencing and found a 2.2 kilobase heterozygous deletion in a gene. Dr. Ashley commented that this allows us to illuminate dark corners of the genome like never before. In a recent publication from Jeremy Schmutz and Greg Cooper from Hudson Alpha, the authors described the unexplained case of a pediatric female with intellectual disability, seizures, and speech delay. Using PacBio, they found a seven kilobase insertion as the underlying cause. I'd also like to highlight that in contrast to other techniques like low resolution optical mapping, with PacBio sequencing, you get all the information about the insertion, the precise breakpoints, the base resolve sequence of the inserted piece, allowing, for example, here, the understanding of a duplicated exon and where the inserted sequence came from elsewhere in the genome. The authors of this study described the approach as a powerful frontline tool for research and clinical testing within rare disease genetics. And that is also what our recently announced collaboration within Vitae is aimed at, to accelerate long read whole genome sequencing into routine clinical care. This collaboration leverages PacBio's HiFi reads to jointly develop a production scale high throughput genome sequencing platform which will enable Invitae to dramatically scale their whole genome testing capabilities, and it costs substantially below $1,000 per genome, thereby opening up broad adoption into routine medical care. But we're not only focused on the future, we're also working hard today to make HiFi reads ever more accessible to scientists and service providers by making HiFi central to our workflows, by making it more affordable, and by making it faster. Most recently, we announced the launch of the SQL2e system, the next evolution of the SQL2 platform. 
The SQL 2e system brings all the performance and reliability of the SQL 2 system, but puts HiFi reads on center stage by adding substantial onboard computing power and optimized algorithms to allow provision of direct output of HiFi reads. Because HiFi reads keep only high accuracy single molecule consensus information, they're extremely compact, saving 90% or more in storage costs and data transfer times. This also makes them cloud compute friendly as they're easy to send to a remote provider over typical network connections. This compact high value data also means that secondary analysis processing times can be much less. We typically see a 70% or greater reduction. This can translate into substantial costs if your computer cost savings if your computer computing power is billed by consumed CPU hours whether that's through a service provider or through your organization. And if you're fortunate enough to already have a powerful HPC system, it can free that system up to do more downstream analysis. On the SQL 2e system, HiFi read generation occurs in parallel to raw data collection to minimize overall runtime. For a collection yielding 30 gigabases of HiFi data, the typical HiFi read generation time is about eight hours. When that process is done, you're left with a compact output containing HiFi reads. You also have access to lower quality single molecule consensus reads below Q20 if you want them, but we generally don't see much use for those. With SmartLink 10, you now have the option to skip investing in a local high performance computing system entirely because we've made it possible to run the entire SmartLink workflow from run design to secondary analysis on Amazon AWS. For customers with limited IT resources or who have quite variable computing demands, this can be a very simple and cost-effective approach and can allow them to get started quickly. Of course, if you'd rather keep things local, it's now easier to get started with less investment in, high, in HPC capacity as our compute specifications for the SQL 2e system are substantially lower with 75% fewer cores recommended. SmartLink 10 also comes with our new genome assembly application powered by IPA, a fast and efficient solution capable of assembling a human genome at 20-fold coverage in only eight hours using our recommended compute solution, while offering high contiguity and fully phased haplotypes. Lastly, I'd like to point out how important it is to overall experiment costs to get both high accuracy and long read lengths from a single solution. Here we're looking at the cost to generate a 30-fold coverage human genome using PacBio HiFi reads versus an alternative approach using 60-fold ONT and Illumina coverage. Not only was the PacBio-only approach substantially less expensive, the results were clearly superior with triple the contiguity N50, 50 times fewer errors, and much better completeness. In summary, I hope I've been able to share some of our excitement about what's possible with HiFi reads in the SQL 2e system. PacBio remains committed to providing better data for better biological insights, affordable and efficient workflows, and lightweight data, all from a single technology solution. To remind you, we'll be happy to address any questions you might have after the three presentations. Now I'm going to hand off to Olga, who's going to tell us all about her experience with SQL 2 at NGI SciLife Lab. All right. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or any other time of the day, everybody. And it's my pleasure to be here and tell you about our experiences. So, as Justin said, I am in Sweden at the SciLife Lab, and I've been a project coordinator at the National Sequencing Corps for the past 10 years. Uh, so what is the SciLife Lab, the organization that I belong to? SciLife Lab is not a institution, it's not the research. It's, it's, it's not an institution, it's more of the research infrastructure. We are based at four main Swedish universities and we are sponsored by huge governmental funds. Uh, and the idea behind SciLife Lab is to um, uh, give the possibility to Swedish researchers to conduct a world-leading research in uh, uh, biomedical and biodiversity studies. Within the SciLife Lab, there is a very generous program for supporting young scientists, but also there is a huge investment in different technology platforms. 
As you can see from the slide, we are working with different uh, technologies, not just genomics, but also drug discovery, diagnostics, metabolomics, proteomics, and so on. I myself, I represent the genomics platform, and our facilities are called National Genomics Infrastructure. So as a matter of fact, National Genomics Infrastructure is much older than SciLife Lab. We, as separate facilities, we existed from 90s when we were offering Sanger sequencing and genotyping. And then from 2006, we are offering also next generation sequencing. So we started with Selexa and 454 and Solid. And then in 2010, uh, SciLife Lab has recognized us as a very important player in the field. So they incorporated us under their wing. Physically, we are located in Uppsala and Stockholm, where long read machines are located mainly in Uppsala. Also, I should say that if there is a sequencing technology out there in the world, we have it, because one of the main ideas with the National Genomics Infrastructure at SciLife Lab is to learn how to use the technology to understand its weaknesses and strengths and also then to start offering uh, for subsidized price for Swedish academical users and also for users abroad. Our journey with PacBio started a long time ago in 2013, almost eight years ago, when we ac uh, acquired the first RS2 instrument that was actually um, shipped to Europe. We loved the machine. Uh, we slowly understood how it works and we worked with that successfully ever after. And then 2016, it was a little bit of the down because uh, the SQL 1 machine came. Uh, sometimes being first in the field is not always the best. And our SQL 1 machine was the first again in Europe. And um, that was a long journey to make it work because at that time the machine was not exactly fit for fight and it took us quite a bit of time to make it really work in our hands but again Pagbaya showed the great support and finally the machine actually showed its potential. Two years ago we acquired both SQL 2 system and to our great surprise and happiness it worked from the day one. It was off shelf and we didn't need to tweak anything and the machine was working beautifully. So finally we inquired uh, another SQL 2 machine, we got two of them and then we acquired also SQL 2E and about that machine I'm going to talk a little bit later during the, the presentation. So what are we using all this huge instrument park? Um, if there is an application that PacBio can provide, we have either tried it or we have applied it and run lots of sequencing projects. So the main advantage of PacBio, as you heard from Justin's talk, is definitely de novo, but also you can sequence ultra-long amplicons up to 16 or 18 KB if you can produce them in the long-range PCR. You can also do whole transcriptome sequencing, you can um, face haplotypes in your genomes, you can study metagenomes, so you can retain the epigenetic signature, look at the base modifications and protein kinetics and things like that. Besides doing the normal like biological research, we also collaborate a lot with clinics. For instance, we are running cancer mutation screen for diagnosis of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia for the Uppsala Academica Hospital. We also do a fair share of HLA sequencing and profiling of the tissue donor match matchings. We're looking also in rare genetic disorders with repeat expansions, screen for infections, for instance, HPV and uh, hepatitis C, and so on. And also recently we started to work uh, more and more with looking at the complex um, um, rearrangements and structural variants in the humans. Also for the last, I think, three or four years, we've been certified service providers of PacBio and we can offer our help to any researcher wherever in the world you are. Uh, first, I would like to show uh, two slides about how we can use uh, PacBio sequencing and those beautiful hi-fi reads in the clinical or in medical studies. 
So, you know, perhaps if you work with human genomes, when you work with Illumina data, not all of the genomic regions are evenly covered. You know, for instance, that due to the short rates, uh, sometimes repeats are not well represented, or especially in the GC-rich regions, Illumina can have a problem due to the PCR bias. So, for instance, in this case, we were looking at the heat shock protein, uh, at the certain sequences within the gene, and those are known to be quite poorly covered by the Illumina sequencing. Whereas when you look at the long reads, either Pagabi or Oxford nanopore, usually it come up, comes up very nicely. What do we use it for? In our group, one of my colleagues, Adam Amer, and his PhD student, Ida uh, Heuer, they were working a lot with CRISPR-Cas uh, gene editing and also testing different systems for enrichment of ultra-long and long reads. Uh, so here's the result of one of the experiments where they were working with uh, ESTRC gene, and that gene is uh, uh, responsible for autosomal non-syndromic deafness. And as you can see, um, looking at the Illumina reads, we see lots of gaps, so the portions of the genes that are very poorly covered. Whereas when you design the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, cleavage site and you want to look at the uh, off-target sequencing effects, just looking at the Illumina data, you will not see much at all. Whereas when you look at this beautiful PugBio Hi-Fi data, with, which span the entire fragment of interest, you can clearly see the, both the cleavage site and also the on-target and off-target effects. So that is one of the um, projects where we're applying and see advantage of the PugBio Hi-Fi reads. If we're switching gears from the medicine and human genetics into something else, that's also the project that Justin has mentioned, that's the Earth Biogenome Initiative. You know it's been started in 2008. Uh, 2018, and the uh, ambition of the Earth Biogenome Project is to sequence all eukaryotic uh, life on the planet to the de novo quality. So there are reference genomes for every known eukaryotic species as an open resource. Within Sweden, we also decided to join this initiative, and SciLife Lab is now a partner in the Earth Biogenome Project. And we also launched our own in-house Swedish project, where we try to find organisms of interest for Swedish researchers, and we try to sequence their reference genomes. And here, of course, PugBio plays a major role. If we look at the Swedish tree of life, how we see it. Um, I got a couple of questions. So the picture uh, on the top uh, right corner is the picture of the Swedish tree of life from the old legends of Vikings. It's Yggdrasil. Um, so uh, speaking about the tree of life and the Earth Biogenome Project, during the last year we sequenced more than 200 non-modal eukaryotic genome projects, which corresponds to more than 700 individual genomes, and at least 60 of those large eukaryotic genomes that were sequenced to the reference genome quality as defined by the Earth Biogenome Project, which means that those are um, chromosome scale assemblies. We sequenced, as you can see from the graph on the right, we sequenced lots of plants, we sequenced fishes. Also in Sweden, by default, we sequenced lots of birds, since there is a very strong department of evolutionary biology looking at different aspects of the bird evolution. We also sequenced some pretty gnarly genomes. Uh, for instance, some of the largest ones that were krill of 18 gigabases in size, also one of the species of salamanders, almost 20 gigs, and also we sequenced several conifer species with a genome size over 22 gigabases. Mm -hmm. Here is just an example of the power of the hi-fi reads that um, is pretty much necessary to obtain a really good reference genome. So this is an example of our latest bird samples. I will not tell you which species because the paper has not been published yet. But anyhow, we sequence that on two smart cells, just to be sure that we'll have even coverage of the centromeric regions, which was important for that particular project. And you can see our yields, our redistribution, and usually when you hear from PugBio representatives that hi-fi reads, 
is something of 18 to 20 or 25 KBs of Illumina quality data. Here on the graph, you can see also that we're capturing a fair share of hi-fi reads that are much longer than 20 KB, sometimes up to 30 and somewhat longer. Also, you see that despite the number of the reads and their length, still we have a lot of passes for the polymerase to wash out the sequencing error. That means that even from the longer reads, we're able to accumulate very high quality data. And if we will look at the assembly, as Justin said, we uh, PacBio has done great improvement in their assemblies. We before we used to run HGAP and Falcon and Canoe, and now with the um, IPA uh, and um, with IPA assembler that comes with SmartLink, it's also tailor made for the PugBio data. You can see that we can get really beautiful assemblies that are completely phased. We also like High Fiasm, we like um, Peregrine, we like High Canoe, but we discovered that IPA gives really nice. Um, not just completeness of assembly, but also assembly accuracy. It's also very fast to run. Um, so here in the graph, you can see that not just we sequenced the entire bird genome at a very good coverage and quality, but we were able to completely face uh, two genomes, the uh, two different alleles. And uh, the N50 of the primary assembly is actually approaching the length of the bird's chromosome. Here is another example, a little bit more complicated, uh, and that is an example when you are faced with a project where PI or the principal investigator thinks that they know something about the genome and they have some a priori idea how large is it going to be. And then you start sequencing and you understand that something is not right. So for this particular insect, the uh, project leader uh, or principal investigator was convinced that the genome size should be 350 megabases because the closely related species are somewhere within this span. We sequenced that to start with on one uh, on a couple of smart cells of SQL1 machine because we didn't have the SQL2 instrument yet. And then we did the assembly at that time with the HCAP algorithm and it was very weird. It was extremely short, just uh, N50 was around, it was under 40 KB. And we are not used to this type of PugBio assemblies. Usually our assemblies with PugBio data are above one megabase. So we decided then just to try to resequence that on SQL 2. And we did it. And it turned out that the assembly size has increased dramatically. And we were not sure why, because we have lots of endosymbionts or because we have lots of repeats that they were not masked properly, or this is the allelic variation, haplotics, and so on. We sequenced that a little bit deeper, and we also did several rounds of haplotic purgings and repeat maskings and so on. And indeed, it turned out that the organism was not at all 350 base, uh, megabases in size. In reality, it was 1.8 gigabases, where you can completely face um, the genomes, where primary and alternative, they differ with just a couple of megabases altogether. So if I would, I were to reflect on SQL2 and SQL2E, how did it feel in our hands as a certified service provider? Because we've been sequenced everything be between the uh, heaven and hell, you know, we sequenced woolly mammoths, we sequenced Neanderthals, humans, viruses, uh, lizards, different weird plants and microscopic insects and microscopic worms. Um, I can tell you that the SQL2 instrument is extremely robust and SQL2E is not much worse, to be honest. Um, 
SQL 2, after in the introduction of SQL 2e, we have noticed, as Justin has pointed out, that the demand on compute went down dramatically. So the storage demand on 2e is at least 20 times less than on SQL 2, due to the automatic production of the high C, um, hi-fi data directly on the machine during the run. So now in our cluster, we have some free space that we can use for compute or other things and we do not have to dedicate, dedicate it particularly to the storage and generation of the hi-fi data. Another thing that I have to point out to you, uh, that is a common misconception that I hear from my users. They think that SQL 2e should be cheaper per base than SQL 2. Well, this is not tr true because cost per base is exactly the same on SQL 2 and on 2e. The thing is, the only difference is that SQL 2e is much more efficient in the compute. So it's sort of, it's cheaper for the sequencing provider to maintain the compute infrastructure around the machine. So that's it. We also discovered the SQL 2, however it is working perfectly, it's a little bit more fuzzy than SQL 2. Um, so SQL 2 e is a little bit more fuzzy. It complains a lot. It says that uh, it doesn't like air humidity. And in Sweden in winter, it's very, very dry. But still, despite all this complaining, it works very well. But it does like a little bit higher air humidity. But with a couple of humidifiers, usually this problem is solved. Another thing is that I told you, and perhaps you know from before, that on PacBio instruments you can also get the epigenetic signature or the base modifications analysis. Before you didn't have to specify that when you plan your sequencing run, you would just get these interpulse ratios in the raw data. However, now on the SQL 2e machine, you have to specify it in your run plan. So this raw um, interpulse ratio data, it will be saved also. So otherwise, if a couple of years later, you'll find out that, oh, for this project, I would also like to look at the base modifications, this data would be lost. So you would have to resequence the project from the beginning. So this is just a good thing for you to keep in mind. If you're going to the certified service provider, say that you want to have both high fire reads and the base modifications. It doesn't cost anything extra. It's just that these base mod files, they have to be saved separately. This webinar I'm giving because I like the technology, but I'm not employed by PacBio, and hence I could point out some possible improvements, improvement possibilities. Those of you who are familiar with technology and been working with that for quite a bit, you know that long reads, whether it's Nanopore or PagBio, they're extremely sensitive to DNA quality. Currently, there is no single analytical parameter that can tell us a priori by looking at DNA or looking at the library, how well this library will load how well it will sequence. So sometimes we'll get very few reads. Sometimes we do not get enough of the, of the passes because the polymerase speed is too slow. And all of that is 100% dependent on the quality of the DNA and the starting material. Up to now, what we were doing on the RS2 instruments and SQL 1, we were running a test cell just to see how the library will perform. Now with the price and the throughput of SQL 2 and SQL 2e, we cannot just sacrifice one smart cell just to do a test. So that's getting actually very expensive. So mistakes and the DNA problems in your preps, they cost a lot for you and for your service provider when you are trying to sequence on two and two e instruments. So I know that PagBio has been thinking about that for a very long time to have an analytical test for the DNA and for the libraries to predict their sequenceability, but still they are not yet there yet. So I would like to give them a gentle push and to remind them that that's a very big problem and we would like to have it resolved. So currently, the only parameter that we know works is when we look at the absorption ratios, the concentrations obtained by the nanodrop or nanoview or equal instrument, and also to how much it corresponds to the qubit ratio. 
to the qubit values of absorption. So if the difference is greater than 1.5, then we know that that is a trouble and the sample would be much likely problematic in sequencing. There will be fewer reads or the reads will be of the world a bit worse quality. But nevertheless, despite of all that, I still think that Hi-Fi data is amazing and both SQL2 and SQL2E are great machines. And with that, I would like to end my presentation and also say thank you to all the sponsors of my infrastructure and my working place, Uppsala University Swedish Research Council, Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, my colleagues at National Genomics Infrastructure and Pakpaya for their great support. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Olga. Next, we are going to hear from Melissa, who's going to tell us about her journey in uh, bringing smart sequencing to the bluegrass state of Kentucky. But first, for just a moment, let me say I really appreciate the feedback on, on directions where we should drive the technology. And I'd like to comment that we definitely agree with you that uh, anything we can do to make the upfront sample prep and uh, QC more reliable and predictable and, and automatable is a, a very high priority for ours. So uh, look forward to seeing advances in on those uh, fronts over the years. Glad to hear that, thank you. All right, and good to go. Um, so I want to first start by thanking Pack Bio for the invitation to speak today um, and especially for splashing my picture all over their advertising. I've heard from a lot of colleagues who I haven't talked to in a very long time because they've seen my face on their Facebook feeds. Um, so I want to talk today, it's a little bit different. I won't be talking uh, so much as Olga did about sort of all the op um, applications we use in the lab, but I want to talk about what it takes to actually bring PAC bio sequencing to a location that hasn't used it before. So 2020 was a year of change for all of us, and I started 2020 as the Assistant Director of Technology Development at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And as part of the uh, SARS CoV-2 pandemic, uh, our team there um, sequenced the first strains of SARS that entered this, this country, and I think all went into lockdown, and like many other people, we really family and professionally thought about sort of what this meant for sort of the way we're living our lives in general, right? We've all had a lot of time to think about that. And because our family is located in the Midwest and we were looking for a little bit more work-life balance, not a super big city person, and I was very fortunate to obtain some successful funding for independent projects, uh, we decided to relocate to Kentucky. So while we were going through the process, you know, part of that is defining what your lab looks like. And so the Smith Lab for me is looking at how health and disease don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, the state of healthiness or diseasedness as an interface between the pathogen that's infecting you or, or altered self in the form of cancer, interfacing with the host genetic context and immunology, as well as any sort of external complicating environmental factors, whether that's uh, macroscopic external factors or microenvironment um, and treatment factors in internally. And what I realized while I was trying to sort of scope out what my new Smith lab would look like was that all of the work I've done on all three of these fronts has been done in a PacBio instrument. So I have been fortunate enough to be working with PacBio since 2012, 2013. Um, and I've, I've worked as Olga also had across several of their platforms and have been very impressed with the performance of the SQL 2. And so with the luck, lucky sort of benefactors here at UofL, uh, my department chair, Dr. Ron Gregg, our EVPRI, Dr. Kevin Gardner, and close collaborator, Dr. Corey Watson, we were able to bring the SQL 2 uh, onto this campus as part of my recruitment. And bringing a SQL 2 onto the campus is only the first step. And Olga and Justin touched on a few of these things, but I did want to highlight um, the challenges and potential solutions of bringing PacBio to a new campus and making it accessible um, outside of some of the, the initial adopters that, that we hear a lot from um, in webinars such as this. So of course, there's the space and the staff required to operate the instrument. This includes the instrument itself, as well as ancillary equipment and dedicated staff. We're very lucky here at UofL that there are already genomics cores in place, so um, we can merge with those as we merge with the DNA core uh, and, and borrow some of their staff for SQL training. Um, ancillary equipment is something you don't hear a lot about, but it is something that is important because it's an added monetary investment. So we'll talk about compute in just a moment, but QC equipment is critical. Olga touched on how important quality control is to really 
uh, ensure that your libraries are the best possible for generating smart sequencing data. We do that with a, a blue pippins for size selection, fragment analyzers for size distribution evaluation, and qubits and nano drops for quantitation. So we needed to ensure that we had those instruments available either by collaborating with labs that already had them in place or purchasing our own, um, which again is just sort of an additary, added monetary cost to keep in mind. Compute itself is its own beast. Um, and you're producing tremendous amounts of data with each of these runs. Um, in SQL 2 space, about a terabyte or more per smart cell. And that terabyte of data needs to be stored and it also needs to be processed in a timely fashion so you can provide data to your customers or your collaborators or yourself in my case. Um, and on top of just being able to have access to compute that do these things, you also need personnel who have expertise to manage and administrate these, these clusters. So whether you're integrating with an existing compute cluster on campus and the staff there, um, or you're setting it up yourself, which is what we ended up doing. We have a Cardinal Research Cluster on campus, but its bandwidth is very much in demand. And due to the um, enormous capacity of data that the SQL 2 um, produces, we didn't want to dominate that entire queue with our work. So we worked around the existing cluster and actually um, obtained a local dedicated server on site, which you can't really see, but is under the desk behind me. We've been working very closely also with Microsoft to create Azure Blob Storage for data, secure data transfer for customers. But really the thing that has been incredibly impressive to me is that we upgraded to the SQL 2E uh, earlier this year and it really changed everything. So the SQL 2E, as Olga mentioned, does the processing of raw data to hi-fi reads on the instrument itself. Even if you have a very powerful compute cluster on campus, you won't have to queue to run those hi-fi read generation jobs with everyone else on campus. You can have a dedicated node for that in the instrument itself. So for us, those one terabyte um, smart cell data files are now 50 to 100 gigabytes post hi-fi read generation, which makes them much easier to transfer, much easier to store, um, and much more rapid to process. A few extra things to think about that don't usually come up until you're right in the thick of it. Um, our project management, uh, we do both internal and external sequencing as a certified service provider. We need to keep these things, these queues clear um, and, and be able to bill appropriately. We use a lot of cloud-based platforms like Smartsheet and QuickBooks to share tasks amongst the team. Uh, the worst thing ever is when I'm the only person that can do something and therefore things get bottlenecked to, at my desk. And so I want to be able to enable my team to push tasks through the queue. And lastly, of course, marketing and awareness. So we are the first and currently only PAC bio instrument in the state of Kentucky and in some of the surrounding Midwestern states. And so it's part of my job to really get out there and engage with people and educate them as to why PAC bio is the right sequencing solution for their scientific question. Clearly, COVID has made that incredibly difficult. So I've been accepting every invitation to give these types of webinars and seminars and every conversational opportunity possible. And what's been fascinating is as I've done that, the opportunities have been quite ex uh, expansive and exciting. So now we are more than the Smith Lab. We are the U of L Single Molecule Sequencing Core with a mission of supporting genomics research at U of L and beyond. The Smith Lab part does uh, independent research projects focused on assay development for investigating viral life cycles and targeting complex immune loci, as well as the generation of some high quality reference genomes and transcriptomes as part of ongoing projects. And then again, what I'm here to talk to you about today is what we do as a certified service provider. Before I go into those details, I want to make sure that I acknowledge my team. We are small but mighty. I'm very lucky to find uh, four exceptional team members um, in the last nine months that we've been here that have really gotten our operation up and uh, moving rapidly forward. So this is already reviewed a bit by Justin and Olga, but I like this slide, so I throw it in. I mean, the, the main point is that you can put any double-stranded DNA molecule on a, a PAC biosequencer for the vast majority of, of cases and get really nice data out. And more than that, PAC Bio has invested a lot of work in recent years on the back end of informatics. So as Justin mentioned, there's the new SmartLink 10.0 package, which is compatible with SQL 2E. It includes improved algorithms, for assembly, mapping, variant calling, as well as um, standard isoform characterization pipelines. I want to give another shout out to the IPA assembly uh, algorithm that Olga mentioned. We use it frequently. It's incredibly robust and incredibly fast. Um, something that would have taken a month to assemble on Falcon in previous iterations took less than eight hours uh, with IPA on our local server. So that's really impressive. 
Um, we started our operation on November 16th of last year. We've run, I guess this is actually not, not taking into account this week, 28 smart cells thus far with a uh, distribution across of a lot of whole genome sequencing as well as some in-house uh, assay development. We currently have several projects in queue that we're quite excited about, a lot more whole genome sequencing, a lot of ISO seq coming down the road, which is fantastic. Um, we actually just ran, I guess this past weekend, our first uh, shoreline biome 16S profiling smart cell, looking at a 96 sample pilot for um, metagenomic composition. We're also bringing up our HiFi viral application space to do surveillance for SARS-CoV-2. Um, you can run hundreds of samples per pool, but due to the sort of demand and throughput, we're, we're focused on running 384 samples per pool, which four pools in a week would be over 1,500 samples a week, which is quite impressive. And then we were luckily the, the co-sponsor for the HiFi for All grant that PetBio just closed recently. We've been working together with PetBio to choose the winners, and we're very much looking forward to sequencing uh, that project soon. So I want to end a little with a, a slightly different discussion. So we are a certified service provider. We do provide um, all of the, the basic applications that PetBio supports end to end. But one of the things that makes us unique is we do a lot of customization. So my own independent research is driven off of novel assay development that leverages the power of long rate sequencing. And so I wanted to give sort of two examples of things to get you all thinking about how you can make smart sequencing work for your project. So the first one of these, is, this is a paper that was published in Science at the very end of 2019. It uses a custom targeted ISOSeq project to look at the PIC3CA gene. So this is a situation where we use the standard ISOSeq pipeline uh, for the generation of cDNA. And then during cDNA amplification, use a gene specific primer to only amplify our transcript of choice. So in this case, PIK3CA is uh, known to in, uh, carry variants in many different cancer cases, but in DNA space, it's about a 35 to 40 kV gene because there are several large introns. We're not gonna be able to target that in DNA space with an amplicon because PCR doesn't do great with 40 kV pieces, but in RNA space, it's only a three kV transcript. And so if we target it at the cDNA level, we can very efficiently um, amplify it you get amazing hi-fi read coverage, and you can multiplex many samples per run on some of the higher throughput platforms. Original data was collected actually on the RS2, and it worked great there. Um, I think it would be even more, I mean, I know it would be even more robust on the SQL2. And then we ran these data through the minor variant algorithm um, on SmartLink, and what you're seeing is the output uh, from that pipeline. In this case, our, our scientific question was whether known SNPs in PIK3CA were in cis or in trans. So are they in the same strand of DNA or on opposite alleles? Because it appears that when those mutations are in cis, it increases PI3 kinase activity, which leads to increased proliferation and tumor growth. However, that increased enzymatic activity also makes it a better candidate for targeting by PIK3CA inhibitors in the case of breast cancer. So what we looked at in these uh, six primary breast cancer tumor samples was the, um, the arrangement of these SNPs on the strands of DNA. And now these SNPs are more than one KB apart, so you can't do this with short read sequencing. You have to phase them in the same strand. So on the right-hand side is the readout of this assay. When you have two red boxes stacked on top of each other, that's two SNPs in cis. These uh, yellow and green boxes represent the SNPs in trans, and two gray boxes represent a wild type allele. So for all three of these individuals, we see a significant proportion of the variants containing those SNPs in cis, which would make them good candidates for treatment with this PIK3CA inhibitor. And so there's a, there was a lot of discussion in this paper about using this type of assay to identify uh, those individuals who may, who may be better candidates for this therapy than others. The last example I want to give is looking at diversity in the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus. So this is the locus that encodes our antibody response. Um, without triggering too much immunology course PTSD in the crowd, um, your, your vast array of antibody specificities are encoded by the um, mixing of discrete V genes, D genes, and J genes at the DNA level. They actually physically recombine at the DNA level. And, and this sort of not quite random, but pretty random mixing encodes a, a variety of antibody specificities. To date, we only have these two references. So what I'm showing you here is the HG19 and HG38 reference of the IGH locus V genes. Each one of these boxes represents a V gene in the array in the IGH locus. 
And the color of the box represents the number of alleles of that gene in that locus. So not only do you have a huge array of genes that can mix and match, but within each gene, you have copy number variation where each copy number variant can also be slightly different from each other that can then also mix and match. So what you can see right off the bat is just the two references we have vary dramatically, right? There are large structural deletions um, that are different just between these two references. To note, these two references um, are either haploid hydatidiformal controls or um, human genomic library collections of BACs and phosmids. These are not diploid individuals. So it was very obvious to us that we needed to expand um, this reference database to see what the true diversity of this locus is and that it would be also um, quite appropriate for us to look at a variety of IGH loci from a variety of, of populations uh, around the world because these are both Caucasian derived. And so we did this, we, we generated uh, six new references from three different distinct populations. Again, you automatically see your eyes are drawn to these sort of macroscopic structural variations. The yellow boxes uh, um, are brand new alleles that were identified that had not been previously seen in the databases. And then again, you have certain genes like say this V169 where the number of copy number variants of this gene varies across populations, uh, which is also intriguing. I think to me, the power of this, of this data is that you, um, you see also the intragenic regions. So you're, the coding regions are in the boxes, but we also use the HiFi reads to resolve the intergenic regions. And it's these intergenic regions that contain the recombination signal sequences that allow these antibodies to be expressed at the RNA level and at the protein level. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But to drive home how important this is, a lot of vaccine strategies these days are focused on targeting specific V gene alleles that they know can produce a broadly neutralizing antibody. But if you don't know whether that allele is carried by multiple populations, your vaccine is somewhat destined for failure if it's not. And so knowing the composition, understanding that genetic diversity in, in influences, impacts, and shapes our the protein antibody response is something that we're working very hard to get the message out about. So as I mentioned, there were a lot of SNPs that we characterized, both in genic and intragenic regions. Um, and we used this data to build a genotyping assay. So that was generated from FOSMID libraries from Evan Eichler's lab. Uh, we wanted to be able to apply this type of assay to any biological sample to screen um, as people recognize the importance of knowing this information. And so we do that using an oligo-based capture assay using long read sequencing. And Oscar Rodriguez and Corey Watson's group designed a beautiful end-to-end uh, -end bioinformatics pipeline, which takes the data from PacBio, um, assembles the locus, annotates the locus, and produces a beautiful uh, IGH report, some, somewhat like your HLA report, where this, uh, this locus is very evocative of. Um, it produces a diploid-aware assembly, which is incredibly powerful. So you can see how the different alleles have different copy number variants at certain genes. Um, in this case, even though this is a genome in a bottle, like well-characterized control sample, we have novel unassigned alleles. And then again, we can start looking at the impact of those non-coding variants on the downstream antibody response. So in this case, um, if you have a deletion at a certain allele, right here, this V-gene 1, then you're not going to express that as an antibody because you can't recombine it or express it in the RNA or protein level. Um, that seems pretty intuitive. However, in certain cases, there are SNPs that are upstream of the genes, so this A and C SNPs, that can actually impact the ability to express this allele. And this is reflected in this far right graph, where if you have this A um, residue upstream, you, the, the recombination and expression of this, of this allele is incredibly reduced compared to those um, individuals that have a C at that position. And so we're just starting to parse the impact of uh, variation outside of coding regions on the ability to express things in our antibody response, which I think will be quite important. So with that, I'll end. Uh, I want to thank all of our collaborators and my team. Um, my contact information is here. If you have any questions, uh, we would love to hear from you. And with that, I'm going to close my slides um, and open up the floor to questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. And thanks again, thanks. Olga. Uh, I, at this point, I'd like to open it to a uh, discussion of, of some of the questions we got in. And I'd like to uh, thank the presenters for answering some of those questions live as we went along. Um, we have about 
uh, three minutes left in the scheduled time, but we, we are, uh, I think, available to go a little bit long if we want to have some discussion around some of these. Um, so let me see. Um, one of the questions uh, that I saw here um, was for Melissa, and the, the question is, do you really need a fragment analyzer? Uh, so I think, yeah. I, so, you know, I think as TechBio pushes the limit on the size of their hi-fi libraries, um, getting, it, they are pushing outside of the linear range of detection of a bioanalyzer. So initial hi-fi libraries that were recommendations were 10 to 12 KB libraries. Those were done really nicely on a bioanalyzer, but now there are, they are pushing to the front to 15 to 20 KB libraries which is really on the edge of being well detected using a bioanalyzer. I think there are some people who like to think that they can evaluate what's slightly on top of the ladder on a BA, but what we've seen is when we try to do that and we try to play that game, if we run the samples in parallel on a fragment analyzer, our estimations are way off. And molarity is so important when you load this instrument, you really need to calculate the number of molecules according to how big their size is, because as Olga mentioned, you're only one, running one or two smart cells for a project, you don't have a lot of room to change loading as you go. And it's a very expensive um, mistake to underload a cell. And so you really want to have the most accurate measurement possible. So while, you know, while there are definitely, if you're doing a lot of isoseq or small amplicon sequencing, a BA is fine. If you're really pushing these whole genome sequencing applications, something that has a wider linear range of detection is really important. I think Olga would agree. Yes, I do. Wholeheartedly. Do you guys have an FA or do you have a Femto? We have a we have them all. Uh, Femto we use mainly for high molecular weight DNA initial QC, then libraries on fragment analyzer and transcriptomes and amplicons and bioanalyzer. Sorry, I just uh, had a momentary network glitch there with my screen sharing, so I apologize if that's not looking correct. I'll remedy it in a moment. Um, one of the questions that I'd like to put to, to both of you was, uh, do you need a, a detailed knowledge of bioinformatics to be able to understand and work with the data? Yes and no, depends what you want to do. So the smart link is extremely intuitive. You don't need to have uh, Unix, perhaps deep Unix knowledge. There are lots of things you can do without the command line. But in order to analyze that, yeah, you need to know at least a little bit. Depends on the application, I would say. And, and I think, you know, to give PacBio credit where credit is due, they've really advanced a lot of those tools in the last, especially one to two years, to be more complete. Um, but I think, especially when it comes to things like annotation um, and doing the types of comparisons that maybe your study calls for, you know, the core provider can take you to sort of the end data type, but I don't know enough about your scientific project to be able to interpret that data. And so whatever type of tertiary downstream analysis you need to do in order to find the answer you're looking for is something that, that you know, we can't really, we don't have the bandwidth to do and, and maybe not the compute expertise. I think when we take on big projects, you know, one of the first things I ask is, is the informatics uh, capabilities of the team that's sending samples and, and trying to, to link those people up with people who can help them with the data analysis if, if, if what I'm going to provide is not sufficient. But I think, addressing very particular hypotheses, doing a lot of annotation, um, that does require some informatics expertise, but there are a lot of people out there with that expertise that are happy to collaborate as well. Thanks. Uh, there was a question around how many smart cells per sample uh, is typically needed for characterizing a transcriptome. Uh, and, and we generally tell customers that it, you, can, uh, you can do a Good job of that with a, a single smart cell. Um, does that align with uh, your experience as well? I think if it's a well-loaded smart cell, it is. The problem is, is <laughs> if you have a well-load a transcriptome smart cell, it can be a little bit variable. So I mean, I, that I think is something that, you know, every smart cell is a bit of a snowflake and every library is also, and fitting, aligning those snowflakes correctly to, to perform well is, is hard. Um, and is something where having a service provider with extensive experience is really beneficial. Um, but again, it, it comes down to your scientific question, right? So if you're looking for very low frequency transcripts or rare splice events, you may need more depth. 
Um, but that's also going to be something that I can't address until you've actually done the annotation analysis downstream. And Olga, what your thoughts are? Yes, I would say it depends which tissue are you working with. With brain, no way one smart cell is enough. <laughs> but if you will just want to just look at the scope of the, uh, of the transcriptome profile without going into deep uh, sort of rare, rare uh, low abundance isoforms, one smart cell is more than enough. But if there is something specific you're looking for, then sometimes even two will not do it. And I think if you're thinking about sending those types of samples to a service provider, being very blunt about that upfront is always a help. Transparency is great for setting expectations and helps us get you the data you need to answer your question. There was a question around, um, will we offer indexing options for HiFi as the smart cell is often too much for a whole genome? Uh, in fact, we are already do. We have a, a variety of uh, indexing or barcoding solutions available, uh, both for Amplicon types of analysis and for uh, whole genome. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about that, um, please follow the uh, one of the links you'll see on the on the concluding slide, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you more. We can reach out to you directly um, uh, to clarify that. There was another question about can sequencing enable tracing the evolution of new variants of SARS-CoV-2? Uh, SARS um, and definitely, I, I think we're, we're very interested in, in seeing what the, the results of uh, the work we've been doing with LabCorp and, and LabCorp with the CDC. Um, if, if we've had a, a couple, at least um, one major uh, event already where um, the PAC Biotechnology um, detected the, I believe it was the South African variant of uh, COVID for the first time uh, in, in the US. And uh, I know that's not directly answering your question about evolution, but uh, as that data accumulates, we, uh, I think we're optimistic that we'll be able to uh, help or our technology will be able to help the people who are doing that work to um, to track the spread and the evolution and the, the linkage even between um, variations as we see going forward. Um, as a virologist who also runs PacBio, I second that assessment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, are there any other comments you'd like to add to that, Melissa? Any, any I mean, I, I think it's, it's about getting our hands on as much data as possible, I think, of, of any type. But I think that the consistency of the data produced with the high fi viral um, application, as far as like very limited dropouts, you can do a lot of samples per cost, um, is going to really help accelerate that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we hear a lot these days about uh, um, governments realizing so, something that I think they knew for a long time, uh, but but didn't really have the the um, the impetus or somehow to do, which is that we really do need long term proactive viral surveillance, uh, not only for this virus but for new and emerging viruses, because this is by 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 no means the last that'll ever come around. Um, so we're very excited to to hopefully play a, a role uh, with HiFi in enabling um, such surveillance efforts if they get going. Um, there was a question for uh, Melissa. What is the cost of genotype and IGH locus? That's a great question, and you should email me at smithlab at louisville.edu. We are okay. actually currently working out that model. We will be offering that application as a service uh, shortly. Great. And yeah. uh, Olga, Olga, did you have a just if there is a question I want to answer from the chat, if I may. Please. Because yes, because there is uh, and I will I will speak it out, uh, shout it loudly, because this is question that is often it's coming back and back and back and back. Is tape station good for Pug Bio? Answer is no hell. No, because what we've done, we've done a comparative studies of different sizing possibilities and type tape station is perfect for short reads. Everything larger than 5 KB, I would never trust that instrument. Please do not, do not use tape station for PugBio because then the malarity will be completely skewed and experiment will fail. Thank you. To, to me, I think the best way to think of it, and Olga and I've had this conversation for years running now, is that the PAC bio is the most exquisite QC instrument you will ever have, right? It's looking at things at the single molecule, and it's a real expensive, it's a really expensive QC run. And so you want to make sure that what you put on 
is the most accurate you can get it. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're definitely interested in ways to, to make that uh, easier and, and less of a, a challenge going forward. Um, better upfront assays, maybe strategies around doing um, sort of aggregated library pilot uh, assessments uh, on you know one cell devoted to characterizing multiple libraries at once. Um, a lot of concepts under development, nothing we're quite ready to share uh, as yet, but, but um, trust that it remains a, a strong priority. Um, I think we, we have a number of questions remaining, but we're, uh, we're fairly significantly over time. Um, I, I would love to, uh, to reach out to um, the, the remaining question askers and uh, contact them by email with some answers. Um, but I'm afraid we are going to need to wrap the actual broadcast. Um, so thank you to Melissa and Olga so much for your time um, this morning, at least in my time zone. I know it's it's your evening, Olga. Um, uh, I really appreciate sharing your experience and your perspective. Uh, and thank you to uh, Donald, who's behind the scenes helping us organize all of this. And with that, we will conclude. Thank all of you for listening. Thank you. Bye.